Hello and welcome back to the show. So I am super, super excited to be sitting down here with my guest today, Michael Guthrie. Michael is a real estate investor, a serial entrepreneur, uh, a syndicator who has raised over $65 million in uh, private money for his real estate investments and now has ownership in over 8,000 doors as a real estate investor, creating passive residual income, not only for himself and his family, but for many, many others as well. So we'll be digging into all of that today, how to raise money as an investor, how to raise money as an entrepreneur, and how to manage these relationships um, as you move forward in your deals and your uh, ventures as well. So without further ado, I want to introduce my guest, Michael. Michael, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you so much for having me, Kobe. Appreciate you having me on today. Absolutely. I appreciate you being here. So before we dig into anything as far as topic goes, would you mind sharing a little bit about yourself and your background, how you came to be and what was it that kind of drove you into this spot of being a very successful investor? <laughs> wow, uh, we could go the whole hour uh, talking about that, but I'm going to do my best <laughs> to keep it more concise, uh, just so we can get to bigger and better things, not just about me. Um, so I grew, I was in the military. I was an x-ray tech in the military. I got out of the military. I was doing uh, MRIs in San Francisco and a friend called me and said, you should check out this new uh, opportunity in the ATM business. Uh, the networks had just deregulated. So I started out working as an MRI tech and then selling ATM machines on the side to local mom and pop merchants. Started to grow that to about 100 units, and then I had to quit my day job and focus on the ATM space, and the ATM space actually made me more money while I was sleeping than when I was awake, so that really got me hooked on residual income. It wasn't completely passive at the time, because I would have to go out and load the unit, the machines myself with my own cash, but they would generate more money while I was sleeping than I actually would during the day, because I, I started out putting most of them into larger nightclubs. The convenience store space hadn't really um, adopted the technology yet. They didn't understand why 7-Elevens had them. But then once I got the educational piece up to where it needed to be, it was almost like it hit critical mass and we couldn't slow down. And we grew that business to a little over 8,200 uh, ATMs uh, in the last over the last 27 years. And during that time, we created a whole network of people that know, knew, they liked us, and they trusted us because we moved their money from A to B and back into their bank account as they owned their owned and operated their own units. So as a capital raiser in the multifamily and uh, now the triple net lease market, um, those relationships of trust have been built over the years. And I think it was easier for me because we were in a, we were actually fiduciary, had fiduciary responsibility to make sure people's money got where it was going. And so we were being watched at all times. So if people didn't trust us just to be in the same room or maybe have a cocktail or a dinner, they weren't going to trust us with their money and their ATM. So over the years, uh, we've, we've done that for a long period of time. And we started to really have a lot of residual and uh, passive income from the ATM space, which drove us to have a high tax bill, which drove us to figure out how to eliminate that tax bill, which ended up at the short road to multifamily about five years, four and a half, five years ago. I have legally not paid federal income tax for the last four years in a row. And during the, while we were operating the ATM company, over the last five years, our tax bill was almost reaching seven figures. So can you imagine, you don't have to go find another job. You don't have to start another company. You eliminate your taxes. You, you actually have a whole nother income. You've increased your income by 37, 40% by not having to pay that federal income tax. So that's how we really got into this space. And we, we started it just wanting to be passive investors. I wasn't looking for a job. I already had one. I was already operating the company. I didn't need another thing to do. Uh, I didn't want another thing to do. But as we started to put more and more money into deals, friends of ours were asking to get into deals. And then all of a sudden I got asked to be on a deal. And I had no idea whether or not we'd be able to really raise capital at all. 
And in my very first deal in 2022, I raised $4.5 million, or $5.5 million in four days. So it went really quick. And all of a sudden, now I, I'm on the map. I'm in, a, I'm in a mastermind with a group of people that want to do a lot of deals. And literally last year, we did 12 deals, raised a little over $65 million. And this year, in 2023, I've done two deals in the triple net space for cash flow only. And we paid 100% cash for these buildings. I raised a little over $10 million this year so far. Wow, that's very impressive. I think for a lot of uh, investors or capital raisers, if you will, uh, that's a goal that they can reach for, um, or at least hope to reach in, in maybe five or, or maybe even 10 years. And you were able to do it in really less than less than two years. So as far as you know, your ability to be able to do that, right? you mentioned your uh, credibility and your reputation as you were managing your ATM machines were really able to help you do that. Um, but aside from that, was there anything else um, that you were able to do in order to raise that much capital in, I guess, that short period of time? Well, about three years ago, we joined a couple different masterminds. We joined the Tony Robbins Platinum Partnership. Uh, we joined Brad Rock, Brad Sumrock's uh, Billionaire Multifamily Mastermind also. And we were just personal development fiends. We were really going for it because we me and my wife had run this ATM company for a long, long time. And it was just us two in the office. We had a remote uh, admin in Tennessee and a remote admin in the Philippines. So we were running it with four people. And so me and my wife would have an idea and it would be, we, we would figure out it was our same idea. It started to feel like an echo chamber. Like my idea was her idea, her idea was mine. And, and we needed outside input. So then we joined these other groups to actually figure out how to grow outside of our own two mindsets because we were very limited in what we were doing and how we were growing because we had no other input. It, our only input was our own. So we actually limited our, our own growth and our own uh, expansion by thinking it was going to get too big too fast and we weren't going to be able to handle it. So we joined these other groups where we met a number of other self-selecting people, if you want to call it that, who spend a lot of money to be in, this, in similar rooms to help each other grow bigger and faster. I mean, Grant Cardone comes to mind. We, we had been in, we were in a group with him. And it's like, go bigger, faster, cash is trash. And he, and literally he's talking really bad about my business because I'm in a cash business. And I just, it would make me, my skin, I, I get goosebumps when you say cash is trash. I'm like, no, cash is king. You have no idea. And his whole thing was stack, you make it, so you stack it, rack it until you have so much, and then you invest in hard assets. So I started to really get the concept of investing from him and from Brad Sumrock. That's really interesting. So you basically were able to kind of get yourself in this group of really, really high level investors, really high level entrepreneurs, if you will, um, just simply because you were um, looking to kind of get more input, right? Just get more input outside of yourself and your immediate circle. And that kind of just led to more opportunities that are out there. So just simply by being out there and, and kind of putting yourself in these situations, just open new doors. 100%. And I think the I think for us, the the reason those groups worked so well is we went in looking to grow ourselves. We weren't we weren't going to get, we were going to give and receive. And where a lot of people are going to those groups to get things out of everybody else that's in the room. I'm just learning to learn more about how to grow what I'm doing and share what's worked for me. So I was more of a giver and not a taker in those environments. And when it came to my first raise, literally just grabbed my phone and started with the A's in my texting and started texting uh, video messages to people about my deal. And by the time I got to G, uh, I had like six and a half million dollars of soft commitments just from texting people. And it's just from relationships created and the trust in knowing the business that we operate and how we've operated it for such a long period of time, I think gave people confidence in what we were doing and they wanted to come alongside us and do it with us. I mean, I literally don't ask people for money. I literally share what I'm doing, the opportunity that I'm I'm working on. And if you wanna do this with us, let's go. If you don't, it's okay. There'll be another one soon. And maybe that one speaks to you because not every deal speaks to everybody. 
Right. And I think it's very, very interesting that you brought up that point because, you know, raising money is usually a very difficult thing for, I think, a lot of people to be able to do, uh, especially if you, you know, maybe have been in business for a while, if you've been doing well and you're, you're at this point where you need to start raising money, right? Whether it's for real estate um, or maybe it's, you know, for a different business, but it, it really kind of stops people in their track, if you will, at the point because they, they kind of have this mental blockage of, okay, now I have to ask people for money and, a lot of money and, you know, they have to kind of trust me with their own money. So it, it becomes a very awkward situation, if you will. Um, so the way you were able to approach it actually was just basically just sharing the opportunity that's out there and just seeing who else will be interested. So would you kind of suggest that be the, I guess, the direction you would go in as far as being able to raise money more effectively than maybe somebody who's maybe approaching it from a little bit more desperation? desperation and capital raising do not go hand in hand. People will feel it and see it in your face and your body expression if you're desperate and or salesy. So my approach has always been, this is what I'm doing with my money. And people, people will actually go out of their way to convince you why their money should go into that same opportunity. It's almost like you, you're, you're flipping the script on them. It's not like you're pitching them to come into your deal you're telling them what you're doing and they want to come alongside you. And they, they some people are so adamant, like they'll be like, how much are you putting in? What do you, how bit, how much do you believe in this deal? And you go, well, I'm putting in a half a million dollars. I want to put in a half a million dollars. I, I on my first opportunity, I, I was deploying my own capital. So I wanted to put it, I put a half a million into my first opportunity that I raised five and a half million dollars. I had four other people come in with a half a million dollars each on my first deal. I'd never done a deal. I was um I I I was freaking out. My the people on my team that I was raising with, they're like, where are these people coming from? And I'm like, I don't know. I they just asked me what I'm putting in and they go, if you believe in it that much, I believe in you. And they they show you with their wallet. But one thing to remember over time being around people you're always being watched. I mean, you know, we all have that friend that you go, I would never trust him with anything. And you have another friend, you go, I just can't wait to hear what he's doing or what he's up to now. And I think if, as long as you maintain yourself and you're always uh professional, you're, you're fun, you're likable, you don't, you're not condescending to others and all sorts of things that you shouldn't be saying about others and just continuing to lift other others up when it's time to be lifted, there'll be a lot of people there to lift you. Right. And that's, you know, that's very, very important that you brought that up as well, which is, you know, how you behave as a, it's just like an individual rather than as a business owner or, or an investor, because you're, I'm sure there's a lot of, or at least certain people out there who are maybe good at investing and, and picking the right deals. But like you said, maybe they're not the most likable person. So it actually, their personality turns people off if you will, when it comes to raising money. Right. And it, I think it goes back to the, what a lot of people say is they got to know you, like you and trust you. And if you mess up on one or two, or it, I don't like to do that with my hand because it doesn't look right on, on film, <laughs> but you know, you get what I mean. If you don't know, like, or trust somebody, you're going to get the, you're going to get the wrong result from your efforts. So it's very, you don't have to be their best friend, but you do have to be trustworthy and you do have to present yourself in a way that they know if some, if they gave you something, you're going to be a good steward of it. Right. Absolutely. It's, you, you're absolutely right. You know, you're always being watched and how you treat one situation is going to kind of reflect how you're going to treat somebody else's money. Because I think for a lot of investors, right. And that's probably a good, good point to talk about as well is when they're starting to maybe start getting capital from their private lenders or other investors are raising money from, you know, now it's a matter of this is not necessarily your money. It's you are representing somebody else to help them get the return on their, on their investment as well. So as far as the managing of money and relationships go, you know, what would you say attributes the most to your success um, of getting repeat investors and cultivating these relationships so that somebody's going to invest with you once and they're going to continue investing with you over time as well. Communication. That is key. I think to everything in this business, 
is once somebody's given you their money, they want to know how, how it's going. What are we doing? What's the what's the investment up to in today's dollars versus where it was when we invested in yesterday's dollars? How are we pressing forward with that project? And I'm in 29, 29 deals. My my first one sold in 14 months and we doubled it. I was I was just in a limited partner. They doubled my money in 14 months. I have my second one now selling as, as a limited partner 27 months in. And this is the fourth time they've communicated with me in 27 months. And I'm getting an 18% internal rate of return on my money. But the fourth time they communicated was please verify your bank account because we're going to be, we sold the property September 14th and we are going to be sending you a wire for your, to return your funds along with your income. Will I invest with that group again? Probably not because I believe in communication. Yeah, they did a good job. They took care of my money. They're returning my dollars with friends. And when I mean friends, that extra more money. So, but they they were horrible communicating. And I would email them because I want to communicate to my investors. And I didn't get any investors in there because I wasn't a, a partner on the deal. But I, I would email them to find out what the status is. What are we doing? How are things going? Because I'm... I'm a, I'm like a sponge. I want to learn as much as possible from all these different teams. And that's why I invested in so many different deals. So I could learn this business from the inside out. I could tell you anything you want to know about operating an ATM company, how to negotiate your processing pricing uh, with the banks for cash, insurance, all these other things. When I started in the multifamily, I didn't know anything. And the last thing I want to do is go raise money on something I had no clue about. So I wanted to invest my money in other people's opportunities so I could learn it from the inside out. And there's just certain, even though they did a great job and they're returning capital and money, um, they won't get another investment from me because this is in 27 months, the fourth time they've actually communicated with me. I think it's a really important lesson for people who are raising money, right? You know, even though the returns were great for you on this particular deal, um, you're not probably not going to invest with this group anymore just simply because they were not very you know they weren't communicating with you right they weren't giving you updates throughout the the period and they weren't telling you what's going on with the property and and really i think it, you know people they value that right they value whether things are going good or bad that you're up front with them that you're honest and you're letting them you know in on what's going on with with the deal because you are you know essentially using their money right to to invest in in your own deals Right. And if you don't communicate, whether it's good or bad, most people's minds would go to, if things aren't going good, that's why they're not talking to us. And that's not necessarily the truth, but that's, that's what we tend to think. I mean, that's what I was thinking. Why aren't, why don't they communicate? Why, why don't they respond? They were very, I mean, literally what's funny is I got my fourth response about this deal. And now I have gotten like six more emails from them on another opportunity that they will be raising for immediately after we get our funds back from this one. So that the, that's the interesting thing is, is they know how to communicate and they're very good at that, at that piece, but they didn't do it the whole time we were in the deal. And when it took, when I would email and it would take four or five days to get a response, it was just like, I, none of us are that busy that we can't just say, Hey, I'm on vacation or, or have an auto response. I'm on vacation. I'll get back to you in seven days or whatever. Or just get back to me and say, this is this is what's actually going on. If you want to have a phone call or whatever, we can we can we can we can accommodate that also. But to say nothing is is probably the worst. Right. Absolutely. And you know, people's minds, they do go there, right? They do go to so what if they're not communicating, like what are these people hiding from me? What are they not telling me? You know, what is right. so so bad that you know they're not even telling me what's going on? So you know, from your kind of experience, as far as communication and the frequency goes, what would you say, aside from just being very responsive, um, is a good frequency of, of giving your investors updates kind of throughout the process of of the deal, right? Would you say it's, you know, weekly, bi-weekly, you know, monthly? What is your experience as far as a, a, ma a, a good frequency there? So the the cadence I like is on the on a property is once a month because not a whole lot changes on a week by week basis. So we, I like to update my investors on a on a month by month basis on the properties that they're in on with me. 
And then I we do a, a bi-weekly or a bi-monthly newsletter that we send out. And then every once a week, usually on Fridays, I'll pick 10 and I'll, I have a list of my A investors, which are people that have actually invested on my list. And I'll take the top 10, one, one Friday, the next 10, next 10, next 10. And I will send the, actually send them a video text, letting them know, hey, I'm thinking about you. If you're interested in, in hearing any more about your opportunities that you're already in, invested in, or you need anything from me personally, just put call in the in the response and hit send. I'll call you right away. And I leave my calendar open for those things so that I can stay in front of people. Because as you start to raise more and more money, people like, investors get fatigue. Or you just don't reach out to them except, except when you have an opportunity. And so I, what I've seen is investors never give you their last $500,000 and they keep investing, but they won't invest if you don't continue to communicate with them. And I've seen that happen to a number of my, that I, people that I've gotten to know over the last couple of years are like, yeah, it's like nobody has any money anymore. I go, well, when's the last time you reached out? Well, the last time I had an opportunity. Go, well, what were you waiting for? I go, would you, what did you do between the last opportunity and now that you couldn't reach out to them and just say, hi, I'm thinking about you and this is more about you, not about me. And how can I help you? And then when they get the email about an opportunity, they know you're not just reaching out when you want to want to reach into their checkbook. You're reaching out because you actually care about them as a person, as a human, as somebody that has feelings and thoughts too. So you want you want to you want to continue to keep the door and the lines of communication open so that you can continue to raise lots of money. And I think that's why we've been successful doing it. Even even this year, as things are slower, people are just happy they get a message from us. And it's not about a deal. Even though they want, even though people responded with, you have a deal? Are you are you getting a deal? When's the next deal? I have money for a deal. If there are, deals will come, but we just need to be patient. There's a lot of deals that go across my desk that people want me to work on. I literally have another call at the top of the hour after we're done. And this group's going to pitch me to raise money on a deal in Houston that I actually walked when I was there last week. And uh, there we'll see if it we'll see if it aligns with where I'm at. But if I was just reaching out to my investors come Monday about this opportunity that they have for me, and I hadn't spoken to them in six months, the, my my success rate or my open rate or my investor uh, completion into the deal rate is going to be much lower than it typically has been. Right. So basically what you just pointed out there was being able to consistently communicate with your investor pool even if you don't have an immediate deal to pitch or something that has to do with you know raising money if it's just keeping up with them with some type of a newsletter getting them updates on you know the market on things that are going on in the investment world asking them how they're doing it doesn't necessarily have to be you know super you know super pointed to a specific you know, opportunity or deal that you're trying to get somebody to, you know, kind of take action on. But as long as you're able to, especially long term over a consistent period of time, just keep in touch with them through some type of some type of communication system um, is actually allow you to convert more people when you do have something to essentially pitch them on. Would you say that's correct? I, that That's 100% you correct. And so many people just wait till it's deal time to reach out to people. And and people do that to me, people that I was in, uh, in, that I've been in limited partnerships with. I only hear from them when they have a deal. I don't hear from them about the property I'm already in on or I've already invested in. That's probably a better way to say it. They, I, they, they will still send me an email about the new properties they're trying to raise on, but they're not giving me an update on the property that I've already invested in. And that that's just, that's the sad part because I'll be like, Love to love to learn more about this investment, but I still don't understand what's going on with the one we were already invested in. And I don't always get the best responses when I send those, but I think I want them to know that I'm not the only one that cares. And if you don't, if if somebody doesn't feel you care, you're you're dead in the water. Right. Absolutely. It's really interesting, right? When when somebody's communicating with you about like a new opportunity but they're not telling you anything about the one you're already in because, you know, kind of what that gives the you the feeling of is I've already given you my money. That's all you needed from me. 
and I'm not going to contact you again unless I need more money from you and you don't mean anything to me. Right. Do I look like the <laughs> bank? <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, that's what right. you start to feel like. And I'm like, yeah, just because we have money to invest doesn't mean you're going to get it. And people say, you have a great deal. The money will come. No, if you, if you have, if you're a great communicator, you'll never have problems getting money because people, most people don't, I have investors. I'll send them the deck and they'll be like, can you just point me to the portal? I don't want, I don't need the deck. I just need to know where to go. And I'm like, I'm, I'm here for you and I'll walk you through it. I'll, I'll get on the phone. I'll, you know what I mean? I'll handhold you, but they, they more trust the jockey, not necessarily the horse. And that was something that came out um, from a gentleman that was, that spoke at uh, the event I was at last weekend. That's, it was a capital raising specific event. And two, two people actually uh, said it other than myself that people often invest on the jockey, not the horse. And, they're, and they always are willing to come in because they trust the person presenting the deal. And they know you've already vetted it and they've, and they feel they've vetted you. So they, they're, they're, they're trusting you and trusting that what you're bringing to them at the table is actually legitimate. Right. Absolutely. It's, it's all about trust, right? And I think it's for an investor who is getting into the, whether they're a single family investor raising private money or they're doing syndications or maybe they're running their own fund and raising money for that, uh, like a multifamily fund. Um, it's it's a different skill set, right? That an investor will have to learn rather than just like going to a hard money lender or going to a bank, which is, you know, it's very straightforward. When you need money, you go to them and then they'll, they'll prove you or not. But with with private investors, it, it's a lot different, right? It's it's basically a second customer base that you have to cultivate and uh, continuing keeping in contact in and having in your CRM to consistently keep up with them and checking in on them and you know nurturing on because it's a continuous game. And if you run out of capital, there's it's going to be hard to get into to more deals. So right the first. The first time you, you don't raise the capital you commit to will probably be the last time you get an opportunity. <laughs> right. That's a good point. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And just kind of switching topics a little bit and uh, telling us uh, a little bit more about kind of your role. Right. So I think you have a very unique role when it comes to, uh, you know, the real estate space, especially as far as running a syndication goes, because you mentioned when you first started out, you didn't necessarily have any experience in, in in real estate, right? You were running a different business, but you were able to get into the game by simply, not simply, but by by, by raising capital, right? A, a skill set that a lot of investors and or operators need. So, would you mind kind of detailing a little bit about how that how your role is within the operation? I know there's obviously an oper uh, an operator, and then is your role just raising the capital most of the time, or are you also uh, in the operation side or how does that really kind of work as far as your role goes? Well, mo like nine out of the 12 deals that I'm in, I have a significant role in helping on the business side of the, the uh, group. I sit in on every property management meetings. Typically there's one a week and they go for 45 minutes to an hour, take some notes, make, uh, make some suggestions to our lead asset manager on what I believe we should be doing to continue to press forward and what the interesting thing is I get, I've, I'm in a couple of deals right now that things are, have been a little bit tighter and my team focuses so much on squeezing the expenses down instead of raising the revenue up and nobody makes more money by lowering your, you, you can't go and cut out Starbucks and become a billionaire that $3 a day isn't going to change your life. But if you can increase your income by $30 a day, all of a sudden you, you can start really changing the outflow. So I have a, as a business owner, I really have been able to come into these team onto these teams and help them run the business of operations a lot better. Literally on a call earlier today, our property managers, like a gentleman wants to renew, he can maximum afford $80 more a month when everybody else is getting a $200 a month rent bump and the, the property manager's like, should we give him notice to leave or should we allow him to stay on for the $80 additional per month? My partner, that's the asset manager said, I think we're going to need to cut him. I private messaged her immediately and I go, 
can I take this question? And he, she's like, yes. I go, we're absolutely going to sign him, but we're only going to sign him for a six month lease till we get into prime leasing season next year. And then that'll allow him time to transition out and we can bring a new tenant in. The last thing you need is an empty room going into winter because things really slow down. And you might, if we, if we go from an $80 increase to a negative $1,480 a month that we're not getting. So we go to zero. How many more months does it take to make up the difference? A lot at $80 a month. So let's keep him in for another, give him a six month extension and say, Hey, when it, this is up, we we have to take this to market rent. And give the give the tenant the benefit of the doubt, and maybe he gets a raise at work. Maybe he finds another job. Maybe he's just happy that we gave him the opportunity to stay, and he's not going to be homeless at the end of the month. You know what I mean? We're we're in the business of taking care of people, and just because they can't always afford the maximum rent increase, a little bit of something is a hundred percent better than a hundred percent of zero. So. I, I understand that because I own seven single family rentals. And when one of those doors was empty, I was a hundred, that house was a hundred percent out of business. And I still had to make a hundred percent of the mortgage payment. So I, I got to feel it from both ends. And so it's all, there's always a fine line on where you have to draw the line. It's not like I have a waiting list and I'm at a hundred percent maximum occupied and having one extra unit to upgrade would, would have been a, a treasure. I'm at 93% occupied. I have 14 other units that are empty at this time in that complex. So keeping him in there keeps one less room. I have to go out and try and re-rent. So a some people don't always get it, but something coming in is a way better than 100% of nothing coming in. Right, absolutely. I think it's, you're right. Some people don't get it or take a little bit to get it. Uh, but this is at the end of the day, a business decision, right? I think there's a lot of, a lot of investors, maybe a little bit newer, who kind of take it as more of a personal attack on them, and then they try to retaliate in one way or another. But at the end of the day, it's it's a business decision. If you can make the best business, uh, the best business choice in what you're doing, and and bring in the the correct amount of revenue that you're looking for, then that's really all that matters there, right? You can actually help somebody else solve a problem in doing so as well. So I think it's it's really interesting, um, the fact that you know you were able to kind of come in without a lot of real estate experience and just start getting into these deals. And I think it really paints a, um, a, let's say like a more possible picture for newer investors who are out there who maybe are doubting themselves, whether they can be a partner in a syndication or whether thinking whether or not they can even get into, you know, these types of deals as an investor. Um, I think you have painted a better picture of how you're able to provide value to a group of investors in your own unique way, even without, I guess, the, the the background of being able to operate and manage a, a, a multifamily sure. complex. Sure. And I think I think sometimes we forget who our customers are. And if you take care of your customer, first it's the tenant, and then it's the investor. And then we're last as as the property management or the ownership team. And if we take I I always it was the same way in the ATM business. We took care of the card holder, we took care of the customer that owned the machine and processed through us. And if we took care of both of them, we ended up getting taken care of on the back end. So you you always have to remember who your customer is and how we're going to take care of them. Because the better you take care of them, the better you'll get taken care of long term. People people want to pay rent to people who want to who care about them. And so for me, I it's it's a no brainer. If we can continue to do something and get a little bit of a lift. It's way better than 100% of no lift or no rent. Right. Absolutely. So, Michael, I want to thank you for being on the show today. I think you shared a lot of value with us. And um, especially as far as, you know, newer investors or maybe somebody with business experience looking to get into real estate. Um, some of the things that they can be thinking about um, as far as how they can add value to investors and also to ownerships teams to you know, be a part of that and be a part of the investment projects and opportunities that are out there. So uh, for anybody who is watching or listening to this that want to reach out to you or want to learn more about what you do, what are some of the best places that they can follow you on and, and follow your journey? So the, the best way to reach me is via my email. It's Michael, M-I-C-H-A-E-L at PacificCapitalLLC.com. 
just as it sounds like the Pacific Ocean, like the capital of your state, then LLC.com. Or, and I know most people don't believe in this, but I believe in being available to help others because others have been available to help me. I give out my cell phone number. It's 509-270-6701. I'll repeat it one more time. 509-270-6701. Shoot me a text. Let's jump on a call. And if I can help you in any way, happy to do so. Awesome. We'll make sure to leave that in the description in the show notes down below so that it's easy for people to find. Uh, but other than that, Michael, I want to thank you again for being on the show. And before I let you sign off, uh, is there any last pieces of advice, any last tips you could leave with us? We don't know what we don't know. So always be a sponge and be willing to learn because somebody else is always, there's always a better mousetrap being built. It's our job to go find it. Absolutely. Michael, thank you again for being here and I want to thank you for tuning in and we will see you on the next show. Take care. You bet. Take care. Thanks.